34 years since the end of hostilities, I've taken it upon myself to gather stories from survivors of the first galactic conflict in human history, a period when humanity was pushed to its limits and emerged more resilient than ever. These accounts are the kind not found in naval intelligence records, emotions, recollections, and motivations, rather than facts and statistics. Admiral of the Fleet, Ethan Moonridge, GRN Retired At nearly 69 years old, one would never guess it. He is lean in build, but still fit, and in fighting form, as he guides me through his home in Zenith Nova. His gentle speech and calm demeanor while offering me a drink belie the ruthless nature he relied on during the war. You know I was born and spent most of my youth in Starlight City, before everything transpired, of course. I chose to settle down in the Midwest because it reminds me of those final weeks when I was still just a naive kid with no real concerns. My parents sent me to stay with a close family friend who lived out here, Captain Rowan Blackwater, in the summer of 75. First contact with the Talon Alliance occurred in May 2175. I believe they were concerned that the Vectari might invade. If only they had attempted that, things might have gone much better for us at the start. Why were your parents worried about invasion? Well, we had just made first contact for heaven's sake. These weren't little green men like everyone always envisioned in the early 20th century. They were five-foot-tall winged creatures with talons like razor blades and faster-than-light warp drives on starships. Contact was having profound implications in many human institutions. We weren't alone? What if there are even more out there? What if they decide we aren't worth communicating with? Even without contact with the Vectari, things around that time were somewhat unstable. The first true federation of the United Nations had only been tentatively established in 2166, and the world government was based in Starlight City. It made perfect sense that if an invasion occurred, it would happen where humanity's leaders were gathered together. Why send you to Captain Lawrence specifically? Well, we didn't have any family left in the States, and Captain Lawrence and my father went way back. They served together in the old American Navy during the Korean Unification War. My old man got out when his contract ended, but Perry was career Navy through and through. That summer was wonderful. Perry would take me fishing on the pond behind his house and regale me with tales from his days in the Pacific. So you were in Nova during the... Bombardment? Fortunately, yes. I was due to return to Solaris in about three weeks when it occurred. The bombardment was the second worst day of my life. It seemed to come out of nowhere. I still don't know the reason for the attack itself. They must have just decided we had nothing to offer. But I do understand the reasoning behind the target. The Raptors, Crow is a crude slang term for members of the Vectari Talon Alliance, thought that if they struck us where it hurts, where all of our leaders were gathered, we would fold like a cheap suit. They really didn't do their homework, laughs humorlessly. Their biggest mistake was clear. The Crow deployment around Earth was supposed to be diplomatic in nature. The small number of ships was enough to vaporize Starlight City in minutes, certainly, and they probably thought it would be sufficient to force us to surrender. Humanity didn't have warp drive technology or energy field weapons yet, but 400 Minuteman II missiles took out those diplomatic ships just fine. By the way, most of this I learned about later. After the fact, I was able to piece together a pretty good sequence of events through my training at the Naval Academy and, of course, through Perry explaining things to me. I was not privy to all of this information at the tender age of 17 in 2175. So after the dust settled, humanity had to figure out what to do. We knew we couldn't revert to squabbling amongst ourselves. We finally had a common enemy to unite us. And if there is one thing humans can do exceptionally well, it's hating the other. We needed to maintain that united front. In a special session, the New World Government named itself the Phoenix Federation, in remembrance of Starlight City. What came next for you? Well, Perry allowed me to enroll in the Phoenix Interstellar Naval Academy. All of the young men on Earth were signing up for the Navy and the Marines. The next generation had to learn new ways to protect Earth. We were all studying new experimental techniques and tactics. The scientists were reverse engineering the Crow technology from debris collected after the nuclear strikes. No one had ever fought in space before. It was a completely new form of warfare, the true final frontier. Perry re-enlisted and was given command of one of the first ships to come off the production line, the PFS Avalon, a heavy frigate. 
He had me assigned to the Erie as an ensign fresh from the academy in 21 and 79 so that he could keep tabs on me. The following year was relatively uneventful. The Raptors sent some forward reconnaissance ships into the solar system, and the Erie was involved in some of those minor skirmishes. We emerged mostly unscathed and were learning how to fight in three dimensions. If the Raptors had pressed their advantage rather than sending cautious scouts, they probably could have overwhelmed us during those initial years. Humans are adaptable, certainly, but the Raptors were evolved to hunt in the air. They were accustomed to attacking from any direction, and we were playing catch-up with our gravity-centric minds. Throughout this time, I was able to observe Captain Lawrence and how he conducted himself in command. He was always cool as a cucumber. Even when we were under fire from raptors, he never lost his composure. It was a significant boost to morale. He also still had a soft spot for me, laughs. Every day during off hours, he would tutor me in command and history. He would always tell me things that would stick with me through my entire career, like, a great captain makes the tough decision, not the easy one. And love of a commanding officer is a far better motivator than fear of the enemy. He certainly lived by those words. We all admired him. His tactics and level heads saved lives during that crucial first year where every ship mattered. Our exceptional combat record led to our assignment to a protective fleet in the asteroid belt in 2180, which the genies predicted would be the staging area for a full-scale crow assault on Earth. Our mission was to break the wedge before it reached Earth again. Genie is slang for an operative in GNI or Phoenix Intelligence Division. We've all heard the tale of the Erie during the Battle of the Belt. Can you describe what it was like from inside the ship? Well, what few people realize is that our crucial role in the battle was actually a massive blunder. This has all been declassified now, but we recovered a lot of valuable data from Crow Rex. The Crow battle logs revealed that their fleet's navigators had miscalculated the mass jump. The Erie was on a routine patrol at the far end of the Belt when the entire Crow Navy suddenly warped in several million kilometers from where GNI had anticipated the attack would occur. I mentioned that the bombardment was the second worst day of my life. The Battle of the Belt was undoubtedly the absolute worst. We found ourselves abruptly encircled by crow ships. Naturally, we were all terrified, except for Captain Lawrence. He maintained complete control, barking out vectors and instructions to weapons and engines. The issue was that no matter how brave an effort we mounted, it was one frigate against three Talon Alliance battle groups, and the rest of the Belt defensive fleet would take at least 20 minutes to warp in response to our distress call. A battle group comprises 100 ships of various classes. You'd never guess that we were doomed watching the captain, though. He instructed the communications team to broadcast music on the Erie and across all known wedge naval frequencies to boost our morale and strike fear of the gods into those winged savages. Laughs. About 15 minutes in, and we still hadn't been obliterated, which was due to the captain keeping us all composed, and the navigators performing some of the most impressive evasive maneuvers I've ever witnessed. Even so, crow boarding teams had breached the Erie's point defense and were seizing the lower decks by force. The captain realized there was little we could do, but knew that the rest of the belt defense fleet would arrive soon. He ordered the evacuation of all personnel into life pods. As the lower decks burned, Pods launched out into the belt, far too small to be detected by the Crow capital ships. With just two minutes remaining before the Gotham reinforcements arrived, the captain ordered the bridge to be evacuated and sealed the Crow Marines who had boarded the Erie behind blast doors. The ship was losing atmosphere, and time was running out before we'd be captured. The Crow Marines were cutting through the doors to reach the bridge. The captain pulled me aside and said, Jamie, today we'll have our final command lesson. I'm ordering you to evacuate the rest of the bridge crew into the captain's escape pod and launch immediately. Naturally, I was terrified at this point, being still essentially a kid. I pleaded with him to join us in the pod, but he wouldn't consider it. Ensign, you have your orders. I've left a packet for you in the escape pod, containing your last lesson. Well, you know what followed. Captain Lawrence remained on the damaged Erie, and rather than let the ship be captured instructed the ship's computer to set a course for the bridge of the Crow capital ship, the TAS Storm's Fury. The explosion as the Erie's warp drives activated inside the dawn destroyed 12 nearby wedge ships, including most of their naval high command. I spent the rest of the battle inside a tiny escape pod, 
sobbing uncontrollably. The Erie was credited with sinking a total of 16 Crow ships by herself, and eliminating the Dawn along with the Crow chain of command allowed the Gotham Navy to defeat the Talon Alliance fleet. They would never again have a significant presence in the solar system. What was the final lesson waiting for you in the escape pod? He left me his most treasured possession, an heirloom that had been in his family for generations. It had a note attached that read, A captain protects his crew, his country, and above all his vessel. Read the words embroidered on this flag, and always remember what a captain's highest duty is. With misty eyes, Admiral Calbraith gestures with his glass towards a flag on the wall. It seems to be a Navy battle flag from centuries ago. A field of deep navy blue with white lettering, which reads, Don't give up the ship. When Starlight City fell, the entire world plunged into a state of grief and anger. Even in my small town in Poland, we were incensed. It was as if someone had flipped a switch, making us realize how trivial our problems were in this new light. Certainly, Poland had been allies with the United States for nearly two centuries by then, and they had supported us during the Russian aggressions of 2123. But it wasn't just us Poles who took up the cry, remember Starlight City. It was the whole world. You know, there were many names proposed for the united human cause in those early days of the war. People with grandiose ideas like Alliance of Terra, Earth States Alliance, and so on. It was a Polish delegate who also resided in Starlight City for half the year, who suggested the name Gotham. In his speech, he emphasized the importance of celebrating our unity rather than our diversity so that we could create a new human nation that would endure for a thousand generations and let no one tear it apart, laughs. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty grandiose too. But his point was rooted in Polish history. Throughout the centuries, we had been attacked, invaded, conquered, and pillaged countless times. But we remained Polish. We were never truly absorbed into another nation. Eventually, we would always rise up and reclaim our independence humanity could finally rally behind one tragic event. Millions of humans killed in their beds, in the streets. Women, children, fathers, sons, obliterated just like that. That heinous act, that display of pure evil was going to forge us into one. The greatest city on earth had vanished in an instant, and we were furious. So you enlisted in the Gotham Marine Corps? You bet I did. We all did. Every boy and young man from every village saw an opportunity to leave and become a hero in space. For me, it was the only way I could contribute to the cause. I had no real education yet, and no skills. I was only 14 years old when I signed up. I had to lie and say I was 17. I was already six feet tall, and they were accepting anyone willing to hold a rifle. They didn't ask many questions. The fact that I hadn't hit puberty yet didn't matter. Laughs. What was the training like? I imagine much of the doctrine came directly from USMC training programs, but there were elements drawn from militaries and warrior cultures worldwide. The American Marines were Earth's finest when the Raptors arrived, so it made sense for Gotham High Command to model their training after the Americans. We started with basic language and mental skills. Everyone had to learn common naturally as we hailed from various countries. Instructors spoke only common and we were placed in units with diverse nationalities. So you couldn't use your native tongue at all. You either mastered common or failed out. Then came extensive physical training, plenty of running, lifting, and swimming. We learned how to handle weapons, how to take down predatory birds, how to neutralize men, how to operate the new M86 rifle. Well, those things were seriously heavy. Kids these days don't realize how good they have at carrying the new lightweight 88s. One, the M86 rail rifle, commonly called the M86 or Sixer, was the standard Gotham issue weapon. Given to combat ground troops, it could fire tungsten rounds at 2.4 kilo per second. It used a hefty solar pack and kinetic stabilizers to allow soldier operation and offered several attachment options including bayonet, underslung shotgun, and grenade launchers. The bayonet was the most favored attachment among grounded and stranded Marines. Next, we studied the Raptors. They typically stand about 4.5 tall with dark plumage and a wingspan of roughly 20 feet. Picture a large golden eagle, then double it in size and strength. There are other minor differences between them and our Earth's predatory bird species, but the main distinction is their small forelimbs, separate from the wings.
This likely enabled them to progress in science and weaponry similarly to us. Having the ability to manipulate tools with nimble and precise hands, or talons in their case, yet even with their physical advantages and scientific knowledge, they couldn't match a human's capacity, when properly equipped and trained, to inflict damage. Can you tell me about where you were stationed? My initial assignment was as a fire team leader. I held the rank of Lance Corporal at the time, one step above Private First Class. Essentially, I was responsible for three other men, including a rifleman, an assistant gunner, and a gunner. We were deployed to the surface of an outer crow planet called Gale Peak in early summer of 81. This was roughly a year after the Erie and the rest of the Gotham fleet defeated the Wedge in the Battle of the Belt. The genies had apparently decrypted the locations of the outer planets of the Crow Federation. Our division's objective was to seize the capital city on Gale Peak and prevent the Raptors from destroying any valuable intelligence from their systems, such as the locations of their inner worlds. Objective was, yeah, precisely. The whole situation went sideways when we arrived. It turned out that the Raptors had planted that data to draw our transports to Gale Peak. What was meant to be a swift landing and takeover became a two-month-long, grueling battle. The planet was supposed to be virtually undefended, but our naval escort had to withdraw due to the wedge presence. They were outnumbered three to one. So what were conditions like on the ground? Things began poorly, but improved as we progressed further into the campaign. My battalion was frequently placed on the front line, though they would rotate the rifle companies so you weren't on the line every single night. Despite the Navy struggling to uphold their end of the operation, we were making headway. All of the battalions in our division had the privilege of wearing some experimental tech. We were the first Radical II division in the war. Two, Radical is an acronym for Radiation Absorption and Dispersal Infantry Class Augmentation Lifeline. Put more simply, Marines and Radical divisions are equipped with suit augmentations that disperse directed energy weapon blasts like those used by Talon Alliance soldiers and artillery. This largely rendered the Federation's armory obsolete. With these suits, we had essentially neutralized Crow weapons. Don't misunderstand, getting shot still hurt intensely, and different individuals reacted differently. One of my comrades had a weak heart, and the Radical suit wasn't sufficient to save him. I was among the fortunate ones who was mostly unaffected even when taking a direct hit from close range. It primarily felt like an extremely painful buzzing throughout the body, but it didn't incapacitate me, let alone prove fatal when I was hit. Gradually, we narrowed the gap to the capital. However, the issue was that the Navy couldn't resupply us for weeks. Men were going stir-crazy. We weren't permitted to advance on the capital until we had naval support to prevent any crucial raptors from escaping. Is there any truth to the rumors about Marine conduct during those lulls? Look, you can't sit there and judge what we were experiencing. All right? We had left our homes and families and come to this godforsaken rock in the middle of who knows where, instructed to seize an objective. But then the damn Navy wasn't there to fulfill their part. We were encircled on all sides by monstrous creatures who had slaughtered 12 million people in an instant without any kind of provocation. We did inhumane things to them because they weren't human. Nikolai inhales deeply through his nose and regains his composure. We began conducting raids into the city. Small groups would go. It was unofficial. Probably a platoon-sized group would enter every night to try and cause havoc. It was a game to us. We would break into an apartment complex where they had troops quartered and get in close with our bayonets. Guys started collecting feathers from raptors. They killed. There was another Polish guy in our battalion who began lining the armored spine of his radical kit with feathers. Like a Polish winged hussar, laughs, other guys quickly adopted that and imitated him. Hell, I started doing it too. It had been nearly two months without relief, and the CO was barely enforcing uniform regulations. Eventually, most of the battalion had the backs of their kits covered in feathers. It just felt good, you know. Those crow bastards had come in the night to Starlight City and glassed it. Well, now it was our turn to be the monster in the night, the ape who arrives with gnashing teeth and wears the wings of your fallen brothers on his back. The raptors almost always soiled themselves when we would break in and start yelling war cries. They were defenseless, their guns were essentially harmless, and their talons couldn't pierce our standard armor or helmets. 
How long did it take for the Navy to break through the blockade? We finally captured the city on the morning of the third day of the tenth week. The Navy broke through with overwhelming force on the second day of the week, and additional Marines were deployed to ensure a smooth capture. I learned later that there had been a communications blackout, which left G and I unaware of our situation. They believed we had taken the city within a week of landing and had dispatched a battle group to dock on Gale Peak, only to find crow ships still in orbit. The morning of the city's surrender is one I'll never forget. 200,000 Marines encircled the city and performed a traditional haka. A sincere smile spreads across Nikolai's face. One of the cleverest things the Gotham military did was incorporate the best aspects of other warrior cultures into our training. Nothing gets your adrenaline pumping and terrifies a crow quite like 200,000 men, 10,000 of them with their backs adorned with the feathers of fallen raptors, performing a haka on the brink of a doomed city. The sound of our voices roaring in unison must have been like their worst nightmare made real. My platoon was among the few selected to witness the crow governor's surrender to the colonel. The colonel ordered the evacuation of all non-intelligence or scientific crow personnel, but allowed the governor to depart on a cargo ship to inform the Crow High Command that humanity was coming. His message was, Tell your leaders, Gotham remembers. I was always somewhat of a loner, an outdoorsy type, you might say. From childhood, I would always find ways to be outside, away from my parents and brothers. Climbing trees, fording rivers, laughs, which were really just wide and shallow streams. I kind of went my own way. I think that mindset was what made me well-suited for the Rangers. How did you know to join the Rangers, rather than the Marines or Navy, as most men and boys did? Well, there was a recruiter who visited our town. All the men and tough lads old enough to enlist were invited to the town hall and informed about the various roles you could sign up for. Marines and sailors would be part of the main Republic Defense Force and work together. They said anyone who joined the Rangers, though, you'd be doing jobs no one else could handle. So they went through and asked, who wants to join the Marines? And you'd see a flurry of hands go up, then who wants to join the Navy? And again, a lot of hands went up. Finally, they asked, who wants to join the Rangers? And at first, nobody raised their hands, which was understandable. The man had said Ranger training would be tough and you'd be in some of the most dangerous assignments if you made it. When the recruiter saw no volunteers, he added, I should have mentioned that Rangers who don't wash out of training We'll get double the pay. And then about 20 of us shot our hands up. Laughs. So the Rangers are actually a separate branch from the Marines and Navy? Yes, we were a new branch born from the tradition of the U.S. Army Rangers. The main difference was we were independent of the rest of the military. Essentially, we were an entire branch dedicated to special operations. We reported directly to the Republic High Command. We had our own academy, our own ships, our own way of doing things. We carried out covert ops, the sort of thing that couldn't be entrusted to the Marines to handle with any hope of discretion or subtlety, shaking his head. Winged hussars, indeed. What were your primary duties? Well, Gotham High Command had learned their lesson during that fiasco on Gale Peak. A huge number of raptors escaped, and valuable data was destroyed or transmitted off-planet before we got a hold of it, because the Marines were just too slow. So they would deploy us in two ways. The most common was sending us in ahead of the main Marine deployment. The Rangers would drop in from a stealth cruiser and secure the valuable objectives before the Marines could mess it up. This involved capturing high-priority Crow leaders or civilians, acquiring intelligence, and occasionally assassinations. We were the tip of the spear, so to speak. Those jobs were the easy ones. We knew that the Marines would arrive a week after us and we would get relief in a hot shower. It was the deep deployments that were hell. Are you permitted to discuss any deep deployments? One of the few operations that have been declassified was the one where I got this. Graves raises his right hand and flexes the prosthetic fingers. High Command devised a rather clever plan to make the Raptors believe they were losing worse than they actually were at the time. In essence, it was a reverse propaganda campaign. Operation Sandcastle. The concept was to drop Ranger teams on multiple Crow Outer Planets simultaneously with the goal of cutting off communications with the Core Planets, then creating chaos on the occupied planets. To Crow Command, it would appear as if they lost 20 planets in a single day. So Tango Squadron, that's the company I was part of then, 
was dispatched to the outer crow planet known as Nimbus Prime. How did Tango Squadron perform on Nimbus Prime? In hindsight, Command should have sent more than just a company of men to each planet. I believe they underestimated how susceptible we were to crow infantry. Don't misunderstand, initially things went smoothly. We were precise, we dropped in from low orbit, and cut Nimbus Prime's communications with the rest of the Talon Alliance within three hours. We were unprepared for the crow reaction. A company at full strength had 250 men, 50 seized the communication control tower, while the remaining 200 formed a defensive perimeter and secured an escape route into the wilderness. Crows were reluctant to use orbital weapons on their own planets at this stage in the war. They weren't desperate enough yet, so if we could escape from the city outskirts, we were essentially in the clear. Our next intended move was to start an insurgency, bombing civilian and military targets, create panic, make it seem like there were more of us than there actually were. We never got the opportunity to escape. It was Whiskey's misfortune that this planet was hosting some kind of exchange program of Crow soldiers from different planets, and the garrison near the communication center was far larger than we expected. The response was swift. After we severed the planet's intergalactic communications, we were encircled within an hour by ten Crow battalions and forced to defend from the communications tower. Now, I want to emphasize that Ranger training makes us the finest in the known universe. We had a graduation rate of 32% from the Ranger Academy. We are the toughest, the quickest, the strongest, and the most intelligent. Many of our washouts became officers or non-coms in the Marines and the Navy. Even we couldn't hope to overcome a numerical advantage of 30,000 against 250, though we made them pay for every one of our losses with a dozen of theirs. The battle around the tower lasted for 12 days. They couldn't destroy it because they needed it to reestablish a link to their core worlds. We held them off until floor by floor they started gaining ground. They just threw bodies at us until we were overwhelmed. The last thing I recall was keeping my sixer aimed at the entry window to the main floor of the tower when three companies of raptors suddenly swooped through our hastily built barricade. They swarmed over the guys who were closer to the window clawing and tearing at their eyes with their talons and beaks. Most of those guys had run out of ammo and were fighting back with nothing but their bayonets and trench knives. Eventually, the swarm reached me. I dove on top of one of them and crushed his head with my rifle butt. I turned around just as another crow struck me in the jaw with a pistol, and everything went dark. How did you survive? I was taken prisoner along with another 75 men from Whiskey. That was when things got really bad. What sort of treatment were you subjected to as a prisoner of war? Well, there was no Geneva Convention in space. They treated us like they would treat Crow prisoners during their civil wars. Each day, they would line us up and select one man out of the lineup. He would be hauled in front of the group, and they would cut off a finger. Apparently, this was traditional treatment of captured soldiers from the days before they were united in the Talon Alliance. Removing Talons was a physical and psychological reminder that they were defeated. So they cut off our fingers, cauterized the wound right there in the dirt, and then would throw us back into the lineup. Then after a few weeks, they started conducting experiments on us. Isolation, nutrient deprivation, psychological torture were the norm. They wanted to see what would break the human spirit. How long until the first man cracked? It never occurred. We held out. We were prepared for this. They weren't using the conventional human torture methods, none of the truly brutal stuff. No fingernail extraction, no bamboo under the nails, no simulated drowning. Sure, having our fingers amputated wasn't pleasant by any means, but it was the kind of acute pain you could recover from in a day or two. The other nonsense they attempted, like depriving us of food and confining us in tiny cells, didn't break us. It just left us exhausted. Most fellows would simply sleep in their cells for 18 or 19 hours. As the senior officer of the remaining group, it was my responsibility to try to maintain morale. Every morning when they'd drag us out and line us up, I'd yell, Whiskey Company, sound off! And the other 75 would respond, Rangers, lead the way! We'd keep up the chant until they hauled the day's declawing victim to the front. When it was my turn to be made an example of, they decided to take three fingers instead of one to teach me a lesson since I was the ringleader. Chuckles. After a couple months, it started to sink in that we weren't going to make it. But the lads and I knew we had to keep our spirits up. We couldn't let the raptors see us falter. Surrender was worse than death or torture. 
How did you all manage to survive? We had been captive for three months when High Command dispatched a Ranger Battalion for a rescue operation. The only Crow military presence left on Nimbus Prime was the prison garrison, which was only about 500 strong. The rest had been called back to defend the Core Worlds. We were malnourished and very fatigued. I recall hearing numerous explosions and shouting, human shouting. It was such a wonderful sound to hear. After all that time, half of the remaining men in Whiskey had lost two fingers by then. Weren't you resentful towards High Command for abandoning you? No, no, certainly not, and honestly, they never abandoned us. This was part of our job description. Every man knew there was a high probability of capture and death. We were expendable, but we went anyway. Operation Sandcastle was all about creating the illusion that humanity was punching far above our weight. They couldn't spare men for a rescue mission when they needed to prepare for the invasion of the Core Worlds. What was the overall success rate of Operation Sandcastle? Out of the score of target outer worlds, 18 were successfully isolated from the Core Worlds. 15 maintained a successful insurgency for months afterwards until relief was available. By that time, the Raptors had withdrawn from the Outer Worlds to focus on defending the Core, so in that respect it was a complete success. GNI also now possessed coordinates of Crow Core planets due to the capture of communication centers on those outer planets. Did they bring Whiskey back up to full strength with replacements? How did you cope after the ordeal on Nimbus Prime? As the commanding officer, I was consulted on that and argued against it. With 76 men, we were just barely below the minimum requirement of 80 men in a company. I contended that we had been united through a severe trauma and replacements would never truly become one of us, so to speak. Instead, we were assigned to handle operations that required surgical precision. After a few months of R&R &R and physical therapy to get back into fighting shape, we were off and running as the world's finest Whiskey 76 chuckles. We weren't out of the war by any means and it was good for the morale of citizens back on Earth to know that even when captured, Rangers never yield. We lost many good men on Nimbus Prime, guys that I consider to be my brothers. Those raptors shed the blood of my family, and I had the rest of the war to settle that debt, a gallon for every drop. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.